This is Aime. How would you describe the current situation of the rare diseases research? Uh, the situation of uh, rare disease research is very strange because if we look back at uh, what happened since uh, uh, the 90s when the genome project started, uh, the speed of discovery thanks to uh, the genetic approach has been really impressive. And uh, we can say that now it's even uh, more impressive with the sequencing approach. We can now decipher a lot of uh, diseases which were totally unknown uh, to us in the past. But uh, thanks to that, a lot of uh, possibilities for testing have emerged, but we have difficulties to uh, finance uh, the, the, let's say, the for the patients, uh, because it's still quite expensive to do uh, testing. Uh, the same is true for uh, the therapy area, where uh, in the past we didn't know how to treat patients with genetic diseases. But now uh, we have uh, some products which uh, reach the market, and but all of them are quite expensive, and some of, of them are extremely expensive. So if we look at uh, the number of patients benefiting from these innovations, uh, this number is quite small compared to the needs. So in a sense, we are at a time where science is offering a lot of opportunities to uh, improve the life quality of patients, but maybe our societies are not able to afford for these innovations. Mm -hmm. And what else can we do to improve these researches? So, we can do a lot. Uh, we can first uh, uh, try to make research less expensive and more effective. To make it more effective, we need to collaborate at international level because by essence, uh, the number of patients is small for each disease. So if we want to have enough data, we need, of course, to access all uh, the patients in the world for some diseases. So this is feasible, this is just a matter of organization. With the development of informatics, with bioinformatics, we can collaborate without having to travel. Uh, the data travel very well. So with uh, computers, we can now do a lot of research which were impossible in the past. So by uh, improving access to data, we can really improve the speed of research and its effectiveness. Uh, but this requires standards and also uh, a change in the mentality. People have to accept that uh, data sources have to be uh, open and that access should be granted to any researcher. That's a, a bit of a revolution. Mm -hmm. And also we have to decrease the cost of R&D for uh, drug development. And for that, we need to certainly uh, find new uh, business models for uh, drug development. And this is feasible because we can think that a lot of drugs can be repurposed, drugs that we know already for common diseases, which would be very useful for rare diseases. And also, uh, thanks to a computerized approach, we can think now of identifying you know, new targets and repurposed drugs uh, already on the market. So in a sense, if we are imaginative and uh, dedicated, we can do a lot in the future. Mm -hmm. And what role is assuming United Nations to try to solve this problem? Oh, there is really an international effort uh, uh, to reach the goal of improving life of patients with rare diseases for uh, let's say scientific reason and economic reason. Scientific reason because it's in fact very interesting to study rare diseases. So we will understand biology much better if we uh, work on these diseases which are really models for research. So in a sense, it's, uh, if you look at the quality of the results, uh, it's uh, all the big uh, discoveries are coming from uh, research on rare diseases. So that's a good reason for a, uh, let's say, collaborative approach. And also, uh, there is so much pressure from the patients and patient organizations that all politicians uh, are uh, willing to do something to, uh, let's say, uh, 
uh, do improve their life. So uh, there is really a willingness, at least in developed countries, uh, to develop programs uh, to uh, boost research and offer new solutions. At international level, we have the International Rare Disease Research Consortium, which is federating now uh, Europe, uh, the USA, Australia, uh, China, and, uh, and I think that uh, Japan and Korea has joined also, in, and Japan will join. So I think that, uh, that many countries now are working together and they are uh, working on s practical solutions like defining standards. You know, if we look at industry, uh, the industries which have bloomed are those who, where people were able to define standards at international level. At, at that point in time, if you have standards, people can tr start to collaborate, access you know, uh, um, the data or the tools which are available in the country. So this changed totally the landscape. So I think that at international level, of course, People are willing to collaborate, but of course there is also competition. So uh, we have to find a, a, a mix between competition and collaboration. But honestly, there is so much to do that there is enough space for every researcher. So we can collaborate. Okay, and we are in Madrid. We have had the first European case of Ebola. Uh, we want to ask you about the, the real risk in Europe, in Spain, how the government, the Spanish government have managed the Ebola crisis. What's your opinion? So I think that uh, what happened in Madrid is really uh, an example of uh, uh, the, the role played by the healthcare structure, the research structure, and the complexity of uh, implementing uh, knowledge that we have. I think, uh, unfortunately, this case was poorly managed. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, the Ebola in general is an illustration of uh, the fact that uh, the, the, if you want to do uh, uh, research and use the knowledge, you have to have a proper health care in place. In Africa, it's totally lacking. It's why the, the, the epidemic is spreading because uh, uh, there is no possibility at the population level to control the behavior of people and to convince people that uh, uh, there are preventive measures which work, you know. And this is uh, due to the lack of knowledge of people and their misconceptions. For rare diseases, uh, it's exactly the same. In the past, when I was young, uh, we thought that it was impossible to treat patients. So that was a misconception. Of course we can. Uh, so if we, you are not in the right mind setting, you can make mistakes. And you did mistakes in Madrid with Ebola because uh, the people did not understand fully the scope of risk and the preventive measures which have to be taken. And that's an organization organizational uh, mistake, you know, which has nothing to do with the knowledge. So you can have a big gap between what is known, because I think the, the way uh, this virus is spreading is known now, but uh, if this knowledge is not shared with the right people, and if there is not a training of the people, if, if uh, this training is not effective and reach all the people which knew, should know it, I mean, uh, it, there is a, a failure. So I think it's a good lesson for everyone. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there is a discrepancy between what science can produce and the way the society use it. And of course, the big mistakes and the big failures and the big drama are always coming from human be behavior <laughs> mistakes. And uh, this is a lesson that we, uh, we have always known, but we forget about it all the time. Okay, thank you so much.